first of all, I want to just very quickly introduce Luminary for any of those, any, anybody out here who uh, doesn't know who we are. So to begin with, essentially we are an online platform and community that is dedicated to making CPAs' lives easier and their careers progress faster. And that encompasses a whole bunch of different things. Um, we started with jobs. We very quickly included volunteer opportunities. And now we've added a number of other things like um, content and educational events. And of course, um, actual like networking events like the one we're at here tonight. So um, what we do pretty much every day is, is spend all day thinking about how we can make CPAs' lives easier and their careers progress faster. And one aspect of that has been this initiative that we're here for tonight that we call Fin in Tech. And what Fin in Tech is, is that it's all about bringing the CPA and the tech communities closer together. Um, you know, CPAs are very, very passionate about innovation. Um, definitely the ones here today and definitely the ones that uh, we've had at our previous events. But a lot of times, a lot of CPAs are telling us that they don't actually know how to get involved in the innovation economy. And on the other side, you have most startup founders who are very brilliant engineers or scientists that are creating innovations that are changing the world but they don't have any finance or business background. And this can be really, really difficult to get over that hump as an early stage company. And so we saw an obvious match with these, uh, with these two groups. And that's what really Finintech is meant to do. We think that CPAs can um, really be a meaningful, uh, make a meaningful difference on the innovation economy, push our Canadian companies forward, while at the same time carve out a spot for ourselves uh, in that new economy and really, really create something uh, or an important place for us within it. So that's what Finintech is intended to do and how we do that is through kind of three main, uh, three main ways. First are events like tonight where we like to highlight awesome CPAs that have done cool things like the minister uh, here with us tonight. Um, and that's really meant to inspire us to get more involved in this, in this ecosystem. The next piece is education. So what we've done is we've developed a whole slew of essentially CPA startup boot camp modules, um, teaching CPAs how to apply their skill sets within a totally different context, that of a startup. Same skill sets, but, but kind of a different, different playing ground. And so adapting to that is really important. So these modules cover everything from like uh, pitching investors to technology concepts to actually how you do a projection in, in a startup environment and how that is different from a corporate one. And the last, uh, the last thing here is, is the placement program. So our placement program matches CPAs with early stage companies um, for volunteer part-time opportunities to help those companies out with a number of different things. This could be helping them prepare for a fundraise through projections, um, helping them with their cash management. Actually, besides having a product that nobody cares about, cash management is the number, is the second major cause of startup failure. So um, this is something that CPAs can help a lot with, and this is what our program is meant to do. In just a few short months since we've launched, we've actually trained over 250 CPAs. And we've placed over 60 of them into various startup companies, um, mostly so far in the GTA, but also in places like Calgary and Ottawa, and uh, two in Victoria, on Victoria Island. Um, so, so we're really getting that, that national reach, which is great. And um, I'd say a lot of this really comes from the support that we're getting from the community itself. So this includes kind of three major groups. The first are what we term our thin in tech luminaries. These are CPAs who are in the tech sector that support what we're doing, um, both in, in, in thought, but also in action. So some of these folks are helping us actually develop the, the training materials and then teaching the classes themselves. Our last speaker, the CFO of Wallsimple, Lean Lee, will be teaching our projections and KPIs module. And some of them just help by actually talking with the CPAs that have been matched with companies to help them in specific situations. Um, so these people are a huge support and we're really, really grateful to have them. The second group are the accelerators and other startup organizations that have been helping us find the startups that need this help. And so this includes uh, all the top accelerators in, in the country like the Creative Destruction Lab, 111, Founder Fuel, and, and more, as well as some government organizations like the Ontario Centers of Excellence and the National Research Council. 
Um, so we really have to thank those groups as well for making this a reality. And then the, the last group here, which really we, we couldn't do any of this without, is our partners. And I'm going to just uh, uh, have some of our partners come up and say a few words. Um, and I want to start out with our friends over at Xero. So uh, Xero makes truly beautiful accounting software, but they also make truly wonderful supporting partners. Um, they've really been with us from the concept stage, and they've supported what we're doing and saw the vision that we had right away. Um, they are the number one startup accounting software, and they were like the first to really really buy into the cloud as the place of the future, which as it turns out is the case. So I would love to uh, ask Will Buckley, the director of Zero Canada, to come up and say just a few words for us. Hey everyone, uh, I'll be really quick because I really want to get into the main event tonight. Uh, so yes, Zero is online accounting software. Uh, we were born in the cloud over 12 years ago. We have strong Commonwealth ties. Uh, I myself am originally from Australia, but I am sort of claiming that I am Canadian-Australian, not by blood, but by passion. Uh, so I, I'm certainly enjoying my time here in Canada. Uh, we're very excited about launching in Canada uh, as of January. So globally, we have 1.4 million small business customers that use our platform. Uh, and over the past 12 years, as you can imagine, we've managed to collect a lot of data uh, which has basically led us to, to formulate the opinion that CPAs are the number one influencers in the small business's decision-making uh, decision process. We know that there's three things that, that startups care about. The first thing is cash, the second thing is connections, and the third thing is advice. We genuinely believe that CPAs are the best place to deliver on all three of those elements. Um, when I first met Michael, uh, he basically pitched my pitch back to me. So from that moment on, we thought that we were very much aligned. Uh, so we're very excited to be sponsoring FinnTech. We think it's a fantastic, a fantastic initiative. Uh, and I'm really excited to see what Luminari has been able to do over the, the first few early months, um, and then many more successes to come as well. So thanks for allowing us to be partners with you guys. <laughs> thanks so much, Will. So, uh... Thanks, thanks so much. You know, uh, as I said, Zero has been a, a big supporter from day one, and and now we are really, actually, very excited to announce publicly for the first time uh, our partnership with another really important uh, uh, group in this in this industry, which is, of course, CPA Ontario. Um, you know, uh, we're we're extremely humbled to have the support of uh, CPAO, and uh, we really are excited to do our part in trying to push our designation forward. Uh, there's a lot to do in that space and, um, and we're really happy to have the best partners around for it. So uh, I wanna ask the, certainly the best person I can think of to speak on that topic to come up here and say just a few words. Uh, CEO of CPA Ontario and former luminary speaker herself, Carol Wilding. Hey. Thanks Michael and uh, great to have you here Minister Bain. So, uh, I will, too, be very, very brief because we want to hear your story. But um, you all know what we're about at CPA Ontario. We're, we're here to support you, all of our CPAs in the room. And there are increasingly more demands being put on you in a variety of ways and in a variety of opportunities, some of which Michael has alluded to. So we, too, are incredibly proud to be uh, a part of Finintech and to be a big supporter um, of Luminari. I will tell you that Michael is on uh, our Emerging Leaders Advisory Group, and I hesitate to use the word emerging leader with Michael because I think he's well past emerging. This guy uh, is out there in many ways being an incredible leader, certainly for Luminari, but also for, uh, for our profession. And uh, he knows that I'm a big fan of his and a big fan of what they do uh, with and for CPAs, and so we're absolutely uh, delighted to be a part of this. Now, I have to say that the timing minister of you coming couldn't be a better happenstance because today, as many people will know, we are moving into the area of thought leadership so that we can create more dialogue with our members and also to advance the profession. And so we're very proud we launched our first white paper today on cryptocurrencies. And uh, there's lots of conversation going on around that one. So please do go on the website and download the paper, have a read, tell us what you think. And um, I think that's a perfect segue to pass it off for an introduction of the Minister of Innovation who knows anything and everything innovation. So thanks for, uh, thank you for being here. I want to just quickly um, 
thank our friends at the Institute for Management and Innovation at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. I mean, this is the most wonderful place we could imagine for this event. And we still get the sunlight, which is awesome. That means it's summer. So um, yeah, thank you again. This is, this is a really great place to have an event. And uh, without further ado, I think we should, we should jump into the actual feature presentation here. So I'm just, I'm just going to do a very quick introduction of our speaker. The, the, the thing is that if I cover everything he's done, we're going to miss breakfast tomorrow. So I, I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to try to go quickly. And I apologize here if I drone on too long. Um, so like many of the people in this room, I, I would imagine Minister Baines uh, went to York University for his undergrad. Um, he then followed that with an MBA at Windsor, and he started his career first at Nike and then at Ford, where he got his CPA designation. Now, in 2004, at 26 years old, Minister Baines became the youngest Liberal MP in Parliament. Um, he won the Mississauga-Brampton South riding, where he served until 2011. Um, after that, he spent a couple of years teaching at Waterloo and then at the Ted Rogers School. Um, while also acting as the Vice Chair of the Provincial Board of the Heart and Stroke Foundation. In 2005, he was elected to uh, be the MP for Mississauga Malton, where he currently continues to serve. Um, and, uh, sorry, did I say 2005? I meant 2015, sorry, there, there we go. Um, so 2015, he was elected as the MP, and, um, and he also, very uh, nearly short afterwards, was uh, named the Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development. In 2016, uh, he was given our profession's highest honor and, and was uh, named a fellow of, of the Institute. And uh, all of this doesn't even come close to probably the most important role he holds, which is as loving uh, uh, husband and father to two wonderful uh, little girls. So uh, with that, Minister Baines, uh, would you come join me on stage? Well, it is a pleasure to have you here, Minister. Thank you very much for having me. It's a beautiful, beautiful venue. Yeah, yeah, no, no kidding. Uh, we are definitely thrilled. Thank you again, UTM. Um, so uh, just before we uh, get going, I wanted to just say, I, I'm sure you're always peppered with serious policy questions. <laughs> Today, we're going to give the minister a little bit of a break. Um, you know, the great thing is, I don't think there was any need for him to prepare for today's topic because the topic is Navdeep Bain's. It's an area that he's well versed in. Um, and you know, any, anybody who's following politics probably knows Minister of Innovation Baines. But today, I think what we'd like to do is get to know Navdeep a little bit, the, uh, the CPA that became the Innovation Minister. So I think that's where we're gonna spend most of our time. And I, I, I do wanna start with the question that probably everybody's thinking. You know, you, you came out of university, business student, you got your CPA. That's a pretty straight and narrow career path. We all did that. Uh, and then one day at age 26, you say, actually, I'm going to be an MP. So can you take us kind of through that mental journey of, uh, you know, this, this um, no pun intended, conservative career path, and then uh, <laughs> switching that over to taking a really big leap in your, in your professional and personal life into, uh, into politics? Oh, well, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you very much for organizing this. It's great to see so many accountants in one room. Puts a big smile on my face, uh, and it's great to be here with my fellow colleagues and peers as well. Um, you know, and I also want to thank Carol as well for her leadership, and it really is on a personal level a big, big honor when uh, I was very fortunate to be selected as a fellow CPA, and that's a point of pride for me. Uh, I talk about it wherever given the opportunity, and I really make a focus of talking about accountants as well, uh, and the profession. Uh, as you mentioned very clearly, uh, my career path was I would get my undergraduate degree in business, I would do my MBA, uh, get an accounting designation, and ultimately be a CFO or maybe CEO of a multinational. That was kind of my vision growing up as a kid. Uh, the objective was to make lots of money, and I thought accounting is a great profession, uh, and uh, working for a large multinational, you would earn a good living, buy a house, the cars, you know, the, the vintage Canadian dream. Um, but one thing that I didn't fully appreciate uh, growing up was how incredibly indebted uh, my family and I are to Canada. And just to put things in context and perspective, my father arrived here in Canada in 1972. 
uh, literally with a few dollars in his pocket. And he left a remote village uh, in the state of Rajasthan in India uh, from very, very modest means. And I'm talking very modest means. Uh, and he, my grandfather uh, and my you know, extended family and our friends all were able to put together enough money for him to buy a ticket to this place called Canada. Uh, and uh, he took this big, big risk at a very young age to come here, and he hit the jackpot. Canada uh, afforded him every possible opportunity to succeed. He started his own business. Uh, he um, is retired now. He enjoys a good game of golf. Uh, and, you know, my brother and I received incredible world-class education, a great uh, upbringing, and, you know, none of this would have been possible without Canada. So when I started my career at Ford Motor Company of Canada, as you mentioned, not too far from here in Oakville, I enjoyed, uh, you know, working in finance, uh, preparing budgets and business plans, working with the marketing and sales team. But I enjoyed the opportunities I had at the local soup kitchen. I enjoyed the opportunities I had giving back to my community. And it just reinforced how lucky I was and how lucky my family was. And I recall the conversations with my father growing up about, you know, there's no better place on earth than in Canada. Uh, we would not be where we are if it wasn't for Canada. And that didn't happen by accident. So I also followed politics at a very young age, uh, was very not actively involved, but I would go out and hand out, distribute flyers for the local, uh, at that time, a liberal candidate. Uh, and so in 2004, uh, I um, was speaking to a bunch of my friends and saying, you know, we live in this incredible country and this riding Mississauga, Brampton South, just opened up and I'm not happy with the candidates that are running. And, you know, I was criticizing kind of the, the quality of candidates running for the Liberal Party at that time. And one of my friends said, since you talk a big game, since you talk about how amazing this country is and you like to give back, why don't you put your turban in the ring, so to speak? <laughs> and uh, I did, with no intention of winning. Uh, there was five candidates running. I was number five, the last one to register. I had no profile within the party. As you know, very young, just starting off my career recently married, my wife and I just bought a house, so a nice mortgage, uh, a full-time job, you know, so taking risks, going to politics was not what we had planned. But my goal was to go out there and talk about issues that matter to me, particularly from a perspective as a young person, and I must confess, uh, I was genuinely surprised by the overwhelming support, particularly from, because I, I represent the community I grew up in, so my hockey team, my basketball team, uh, the uh, homework club, uh, the soup kitchen, uh, the, the squad that we had, all, just the local community really uh, supported me uh, and I was genuinely surprised with the overwhelming support. Surprised the party, which did not think I was going to win. Surprised myself and my friends. And, um, and that's how I got into it. So it wasn't a calculated political plan. Uh, it was genuinely, you know, a desire to give back to the best uh, country in the world at a federal level a desire to talk about issues that mattered, uh, and I was very blessed and fortunate to get into politics. So, you know, not a typical lawyer or political science or history major, uh, and obviously many people did make fun of me, saying, you sure accountants will do well in politics, and you sure you've got the skill sets for politics? Uh, but I was very fortunate that I had many good mentors uh, and many people to support me through that journey. That's, I mean, that's really interesting. I mean, you'd, you'd think that such a big shift would be you know, something that you had uh, pr had a lot of premeditation about, but it sounds... Genuinely, an opportunity arose, uh, and I felt I could make a positive impact, and I was really blessed, as many of us can attest to, you know, you work hard, but timing matters, yeah. and a little bit of luck. So obviously I worked hard, but very, very blessed with the opportunity, and I was very lucky to have the support that I received. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, I think a lot of the things that affect all of our lives the most are things that we don't really imagine happening. And it's just, it's really interesting to hear that that's how, you know, that set off a chain of events that led to you sitting here today. So it's... Um, wow. But not too many accountants in politics. We've got to change that. Uh, but the department that I'm involved in with innovation, science, and economic development, uh, there's quite a few accountants. Uh, in, in, in the civil service there. So I take enormous pride in seeking out those accountants, uh, working with them, uh, if it's young accountants, mentoring them, 
if it's seasoned uh, you know, uh, public servants, learning from them and their experiences. So it, it's nice to see the profession doing uh, well in the bureaucracy. I'd like to see a little bit more represented on uh, the public side of it, the elected side of it. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the reasons that I really love your story is that accountants, as accountants, we have this stereotype that we're <laughs> introverted, that we're reserved, and pretty much you take that generalization and you just crush it and, and throw it out the window. So that, that's, that's really great. I mean, were you, the question I have around that is like, were you always very comfortable talking in front of crowds and being out in, in front, or is it, is it something you just picked up? Because I, I did hear that your first speech competition didn't go so well. Wow, you've done your homework, <laughs> uh, which is scary. Um, no, I am, was actually uh, very, very uncomfortable speaking in front of large crowds. Uh, I guess maybe that's part of the reason why I selected the accounting profession. I like numbers. Uh, I felt comfortable in a smaller, more controlled environment, behind the scenes, prepare reports, do budgets, do that kind of analysis, support function in, in some cases, giving advice, as you mentioned, in your remarks as well. Um, and public speaking was not something I was very comfortable with, and you're absolutely right. The first speech competition I entered in, uh, I was, I think, in my early teens, and I had practiced for weeks uh, for this competition. And I went on stage and I froze, uh, completely uh, forgot uh, my remarks, which I had memorized and internalized. Uh, I finished in 19th place out of 20 people in the competition, and the 20th person didn't even show up. <laughs> so uh, it was a very humble beginning in public speaking, I can tell you right now. Um, and uh, up until today, some of my colleagues and friends were aware of my uh, initial entrance into public speaking do highlight that time to time. Uh, and I do recall not too long ago, in 2004, when I was first elected in the House of Commons and I was giving my first set of remarks, I was so nervous. Uh, luckily, I was standing up and we have desks that cover our knees. My knees were shaking. Um, but I think over a period of time with practice and opportunities and with coaching and advice, uh, I've improved a bit. Uh, but I can tell you, it, uh, it was not something that came to me naturally. Well, I, I didn't see your first speech competition, but given what you've explained, you've definitely improved more than just a little bit. So <laughs> that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's also, I think, heartening for all of us out, out there that are, have skill sets that we wish we were better at. And, you know, it's, you just got to keep on going and eventually you'll become like the minister. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. The key to the game is, is, is practice obviously makes a big difference, but Again, find people. I'll, I'll be honest with you. A few weeks ago, I, I sought out friends who do media training to give me advice on what are some of the mistakes I'm making, how, how can I choose my words more carefully and more thoughtfully, how can I communicate complex issues in a manner that would resonate with Canadians and constituents, how can I sometimes deal in an environment where I have a limited time span to talk about an issue and effectively get my message across. So I'm constantly learning and growing. I'm not a... Uh, uh, perfect by any means, uh, but I think uh, just being open to advice and feedback and, and, and learning from others. And I actively watch, even when I'm in cabinet, there are certain ministers that do an effective job of communicating their uh, viewpoints or managing meetings or running meetings. And I'm always learning how I can improve myself. And I think that's the mindset is you've got to be open minded and you genuinely have to seek out mentors. You have to genuinely seek out individuals who are really good at uh, certain skills or public speaking or communicating and get their advice and, and I think that goes a long way. Well, I have to say I see a lot of similarities with that and, uh, and, and being an entrepreneur and, and it's actually an area that we'll, we'll touch on in a, actually in this next question here. Uh, I mean, you were, you were young, you walked into the, you know, into parliament day one after just being elected. Were you confident that you knew what you were doing or were you kind of, you know, trying to just figure it out day by day. I mean, that's what we do as entrepreneurs. We don't really know what we're doing. We're figuring it out, and that's... I'm kind of like that duck in water. Okay. We're very calm, uh, but if you look underneath the water, I'm paddling like crazy. <laughs> uh, so obviously, it was very intimidating as a 26-year-old, or 27 when I just turned 27 in June, uh, when I entered the House of Commons, because the average age at that time of a parliamentarian was 55 years old. So these individuals, and I say this respectfully, and I hopefully this doesn't go to some of my colleagues, were my father's age. 
And so, you know, I'm hanging out with peers now, talking about issues on the same level, who are, um, uh, who are at the same age as my, as my father, and who had more life experiences, uh, who had more political experience, and uh, it, it was a challenge to earn their trust, uh, to be able to effectively champion issues that I cared about, uh, and uh, to engage them in a meaningful way. And one of the, one of the I think, uh, aspects, aspects that apply in politics and in any profession is how well do you work with others? How well do you work in a team? I didn't go in there with this young kind of attitude that I know it all or I am in a position uh, that's unique and special and I deserve some sort of special treatment. I went there with a the desire to really work with others, learn um, and earn the trust in the good old fashioned way, which is hard work. Uh, I made sure that uh, I did my homework, was prepared, read my briefings, participated in debates, engaged in conversation, did my constituency work. Um, and so I think with the passage of time, I was able to earn the trust of my colleagues. But at the beginning, it was challenging. They would see me as this young parliamentarian. Oh, that's great. We have some young person. Nice to see you. And they would continue the conversation. Um, and so it was a bit frustrating uh, at the beginning. Uh, but uh, I was very fortunate uh, at that time, the sitting Prime Minister, uh, Paul Martin, uh, he and I actually built a rapport, uh, we built uh, you know, a good understanding of some key issues, and he made me his parliamentary secretary. And that uh, was enormous for my confidence, uh, that put me in good standing with my peers, uh, and he also guided and mentored me quite a bit. And you know how often can you say in your 20s that the sitting prime minister of the country is mentoring you. So I was very blessed with that kind of mentorship and leadership and uh, that's had a, a lasting impact. And I still call uh, Prime Minister Martin time to time to get his feedback. So uh, again, if there's one point I can underscore is the importance of mentors, uh, seeking out people. Uh, you'd be surprised, uh, even though they may be in positions uh, that are two, three levels above you, uh, if you make the point of seeking their advice, respectful of their time, uh, and very thoughtful in your approach, uh, they'd be more than willing to uh, mentor you and guide you. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say I, that that point is really on par with uh, our experience, my co-founder Adams and my, who throughout this experience of starting a company, we have approached a number of people that we don't know at all. And just, uh, as you said, if you approach them in a respectful way where you, you, know, you value their time and, and you're trying to learn from them, it's really amazing what people will do. They will go out of their way to, to help you. And, uh, and I mean, we didn't have the, the prime minister doing that for us. Not, not, not yet, at least. I don't know if you want to give Justin a poke, but. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think a lot of us can imagine how your CPA background is helpful when it comes to things like budgeting and stuff like that. But um, what, what we were kind of interested in finding out is, are there any unique or almost unusual, uh, unexpected times when your CPA skill set has come into handy in your political career? Well, I think you can't underestimate the importance of just being comfortable with balance sheets, being comfortable with numbers, and as you mentioned, even on a cash basis, Government is a big, big deal. We're talking about billions and billions of dollars. You know, we have a fiscal framework at the federal level that's well over $300 billion. So there's a lot of money we're dealing with. Uh, the department that I oversee uh, sees billions of dollars in different initiatives that we're involved in with industry, uh, promoting science and research and economic development. And, you know, it's interesting, the basic understanding of accrual accounting or how to reconcile supplementary estimates with the budget, or how to understand uh, some of those issues, is very, very challenging for some parliamentarians who don't have that background, uh, who are great public policy makers, who are very comfortable with debates, but necessarily uh, aren't as comfortable with numbers. Uh, and so I can tell you there's many occasions where when I was a member of parliament for the government and in opposition, where MPs would come and say, okay, take me through the supplementary estimates. What does this mean? How do I interpret this? Year-over-year -year analysis. What does this bracket you know, mean? You know, like, you'd be surprised because a lot of people don't read financial statements. Many people don't understand, you know, again, these are big numbers. And if you're, if you're comparing year-over-year, month-versus-month, uh, a time period, um, you know, how, how, do, how do you, first of all, interpret that data? And then how can you properly understand it in a way that you can you be a proper challenge function if you're in opposition or if you're in government, how does it help you make better decisions? And, um, and I remember when I became the Minister of Innovation, 
uh, my deputy minister didn't fully appreciate my love of numbers and I asked him some very straightforward questions. I won't put him on the spot because he is a tremendously talented public servant. Uh, but he said, you're the first minister that asked me so many questions around numbers. Can you give me grants? Can you tell me exactly the budget? How many full-time employees? What the budget looks here? Like Those were my initial instincts. It wasn't to take me through the pieces of legislation I'm responsible for. My first instinct was take me through the budgets, take me through the numbers. Where do we spend money? How does our industrial policy work? Where do we allocate resources? What is our return on investment? And that's not often the case in politics. That's not the language or the mindset. Uh, and I think that's you know, helped me enormously with my colleagues uh, and, of course, has helped me uh, in my current position as well. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it, it, what, I, what I hear from you is it's, it's kind of this just an intrinsic comfortability with, with numbers, and it's where you go, where your mind goes to first. And I think regardless of the political stripes of anybody in here, we probably, I mean, we're all accountants, so maybe that skews us to the number, but, um, but I think we'd all like to see more, you know, more politicians and more uh, civil servants taking that approach. Yeah, I mean, I would love to just like at lunchtime spend hours and hours with the public, uh, you know, our, our, our parliamentary budget officer and talk about the budgets. Like, I, that stuff excites me, right? <laughs> but I suspect some of my colleagues would start falling asleep within a matter of 30 seconds, right? So I think uh, that is inherently attributed to uh, my background, uh, my upbringing, uh, with my parents instilling the importance of a good education, but also the CPA. When you tell people you're an accountant, they see you through a different light. There is a, a level of respect uh, for the accounting profession, uh, and uh, I think uh, that's helped me in, in many, many occasions, particularly analyzing budgets, analyzing government expenditures, and how we allocate resources uh, and what decisions we make. Uh, and uh, it's still today, uh, uh, my first instinct is uh, to go through a set of numbers to make my case before I get into the policy arguments. Well, I think that's actually a really great segue because um, one of the things that I think Carol and I spoke about when, when she was here, or when, not here, but when we were having a, a speaker session with, with her, was that sometimes it's really difficult for us to keep uh, CPAs, especially when they take a non-traditional career path, connected with the designation. And it seems like um, you, you actually have a really strong personal connection with the designation. Um, can, can you explain why that might be particularly the case with you or is there a learning for us to take away and, and be able to apply that to all of the other non-traditional CPAs out there that we'd like to keep you know, close, uh, close to the profession? Well, first of all, I mean, CPA opened many doors for me. Uh, it allowed me uh, to pursue a career uh, at a multinational automaker. Uh, it allowed me uh, to get into politics even. I think uh, people were impressed with someone with an accounting background wanting to run for politics. So I'm indebted to uh, the CPA from that perspective. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, what's really important for me and why I take enormous pride in, in working with accountants in my department or when other accountants want to get involved in politics and why I'm so excited is we need diversity of perspectives and ideas and points of views. If we just had lawyers, as politicians, or if we just had engineers uh, as politicians, we actually need people of different backgrounds. And I think uh, accountants kind of were understated, we underestimate ourselves, and I know this is a gross generalization, uh, but I think it's important to have that viewpoint and that diversity of thought and idea and perspective uh, is what we need when we talk about policy, what we need uh, at management or senior management levels, what we need at the board level. And uh, earlier today, I was at the Women Forum, um, for, uh, held uh, today, and we talked about the passage of Bill C-25. And uh, this is a new legislation that was passed that promotes greater uh, board diversity. Companies need now to have very clear diversity policies, need to clearly have a policy when it comes to gender. Uh, and if they don't, they must explain to the shareholders why not. And the idea behind this is not, again, because this is a PR stunt or this is good social policy or this is political posturing. This is good for the bottom line. And if you talk about innovation, and you can speak from your own experience, Michael, innovation is about challenging the status quo. It's about you know, new solutions, new ideas, new way of thinking. And the only way you can have that is people from different viewpoints looking at a problem differently, coming up with new solutions. And so this is where I think accountants can play a role. This is why I encourage accountants to n sometimes not follow a traditional path. 
You and I were talking about this when we walked in. The startup community uh, that does so much in terms of creating jobs, uh, in terms of generating wealth, in terms of solving some of the challenges we're dealing with society, aren't necessarily accountants, right? Um, and so how do, the, how do accountants engage with that, that ecosystem? How do they engage with that community? Uh, and they will only enrich uh, the opportunities for startups. They will only create better opportunities uh, for startups. So I think that's what uh, I've done from my point of view, but you're doing the same thing uh, in your capacity as well by building this platform. And I think that is very, very important. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to be much more uh, broad in our thinking of accountants. And I love these CPA ads. I really, really do love them because this one's a great example, right? It's not your traditional ROI. It is, but from a very, you know, a different point of view, talking about, again, from clean tech or from, uh, from an environmental perspective. Accountants are much, much more than numbers. Uh, it's strategic advice. It's strategic thinking. It's critical thinking, and those skill sets apply to many professions, including accounting and public policy, sorry, including in government and public policy. And so that's what I would encourage, and I think it's just essential uh, when we talk about diversity. Yeah, I, you know, it, it, I actually want to circle back to that in, in just a moment. Um, I mean, and that's partially even the name of this event. You know, the idea is from CPA to blank, and each time that's a different blank. We've had entrepreneur and CEO and CFO and innovation minister and it's, it's really amazing that diversity within our profession and I, I, I want to jump back to that in just a second but I know uh, just based on the time we wanted to try something fun here we've got a little bit of a lightning round okay. and so if you're open to it these should be one word one phrase answers quick questions just to get have people get to know you a little bit I gotta talk to my legal counsel before uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think you'll we'll, we'll go there but you can, let, you can let us know no comment works too no no worries I, I will do my best okay well I'll, I'll, I'll start out with 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 a, with a law ball for you so um, so what's the desktop background on your computer so you'd be surprised uh, at, at home it's uh, a picture of my wife and two young girls I'm not actually surprised yeah, yeah. by because, that. That, one, that uh, one's like pretty... My, wife, my life is very <laughs> simple. I love my uh, profession. I love uh, the fact that I'm uh, involved in politics. And my other passion is my family. Uh, and in between, if I get a chance to work out, it's a bonus. But those are basically you know, the two, two aspects of my life that I'm very proud of. Great, perfect segue. So the next question is, what, what's one thing of the many that your wife is better than you at? Oh, and that, the key point is many. Uh, she is actually a better speech writer than myself. She's okay. very political. Uh, she analyzes my speeches. And she's an accountant, by the way. Here's another oh, point. Wow. Jeez, I, just, I just thought. wanted to highlight that. Is she a better accountant than you? No doubt. And, uh, you, and again, I don't want to open up old wounds, but she is a CPA-CA. So Carol can understand what that's all about. Uh, um, and I'm a CPA-CMA, so I just want to let you know what that's all about. But uh, she <laughs> we'll is, stay away from that she politically is charged extremely topic. political. Uh, she reads up on uh, industry issues all the time. Cool. And when I speak at the House of Commons or if I'm giving a speech out in public, she'll call me after and say, why did you say this? You should have <laughs> done this. And there's often cases where I've drafted speeches or my team has drafted speeches. I give it to her and it comes back with a lot of red ink. Uh, and so she has many, many advantages over me, but particularly in when it comes speech to uh, speech writing and probably even public speaking. <laughs> there you go. So the next Minister of Innovation is? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm laughing because, you know, I know how tough it is being a, a partner of a politician. So that's a lot of hard work. And so that would be very difficult for me that she makes a that's, big that's sacrifice. It's funny that that job scares you. Yeah, that job does. Because <laughs> she raises uh, my two young girls, our two young girls. She has a full-time job, and she's more political than I am, so wow. it's, uh, she does it all. So, yeah, good, good resume and there. And she's an accountant. And she's an accountant, which is definitely the most important. Um, so, uh, next question is, what innovation buzzword are you the most tired of? Oof. Uh, the most, uh, the buzzword. Um, I would say, because the word innovation itself. I think, huh. uh, I think innovation uh, is used too loosely. Uh, I have a very clear definition of it. Uh, I, uh, I speak to it, but I think innovation now is used by fairly often and fairly loosely, and, and sometimes it can be a bit fatiguing. Fair, yeah. Um, okay, so can you tell us the accounting term that you think best describes your personality? <laughs> Balance. 
Balance. Ooh, good one. Okay, yeah, look at that. He went around with applause. There you go. Um, Jeez, is this really loud or is it just me and the, okay, good. Um, so uh, this one, um, th this one might be a little contentious, but if, if you could name a game or a sport that you'd kick Prime Minister Trudeau's butt at. So um, he is, first of all, he's very fit. Uh, he and I went running in China together. Uh, this is in Guangzhou. And uh, I barely kept up with him. So he's physically, he really takes care of himself. He takes enormous pride in exercising. He's a great boxer. I was going to say, you're not going to get into a boxing no match. No way, I don't, yeah, I don't stand a chance. I don't stand a chance. But he cannot play basketball if his life depends on it. And uh, I have no doubt that even blindfolded, I can beat him in basketball. Oh, Prime Minister Trudeau, there's your challenge. <laughs> blindfolded basketball. Here we go. Okay, so the, the last one before we jump into the more, more serious stuff, and this one is, is, is personal interest on my part. What, what, do you, what do you say when you're at a party and somebody asks you what you do? Or do you just not get that anymore? No, I definitely get that. That's one thing I, you can't take yourself too seriously. Um, you, know, you know, I'm obviously very blessed to be a, a, a parliamentarian. I'm honored to be an MP, represent an amazing community where I'm raising my daughters in Mississauga. Uh, and you can't, you know, can't take yourself too seriously. In many, many cases, people don't uh, recognize you, which is great. And it was a bit humbling at the beginning when I was first uh, appointed to cabinet. Uh, I thought, wow, I've got name recognition. I've been in the media. People will recognize me. And I recall for the first few weeks, many came up to me, took pictures of me, thinking I was a minister of defense. Okay. <laughs> So uh, forget about asking who I am. People completely f like mistake me for someone else. And uh, so uh, I, you know, there's many people I meet that uh, don't follow politics or uh, they do, they don't follow me, uh, that have no, no idea who I am. And I you know, start off by saying I'm a public servant. Uh, usually if they ask a follow-up question, then I say I'm an MP. And if they really get into it, then I finally explain, um, you know, Minister of Innovation. Uh, but, uh, you know, that happens often. People ask me, and, and I take enormous pride saying I represent the best country in the world. There you go. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for playing along with our lightning round there. Um, and, and, and I hate to go from super fun to, like, more, uh, more serious, but I think that this is a really important um, thing to share, especially in your position, is that, you know, in 2011, you lost an election. And in, in your line of work, that means you also lose your job, yes. which is really tough. And I think everybody here, we've all dealt with um, professional setbacks and professional challenges, but this is super public. And, and so what I, what I wanted to ask is, you know, is there anything that you learned from that experience that you could share with us on how to handle career setbacks and clearly bounce right back and, and even, you know, ab above the, the place that you were before? So it was very humbling. Uh, because I did not see the loss coming. Uh, we worked very hard. We had a great team. Uh, you know, the feedback we were getting from the doors was generally very positive. We had put together a very strong campaign. But as some of you who follow politics, it's very party and leader centric. So if the party does well or your party's leader does well, then you ride on those coattails and you do well. Uh, conversely, it's true. If the party doesn't do well and the leader doesn't do well, then the likelihood of you succeeding is very minimal unless you have incredible name recognition or some sort of unique dynamic in the constituency that you represent. So it was genuinely unexpected. So you're absolutely right. Uh, the first of all, my initial instincts was I had a team of about uh, eight to 10 people that worked for me. So my, my instincts was how do I make sure they find meaningful employment right off the bat? Uh, because you know these people put a lot of sweat equity, they work really hard for you, they go above and beyond the normal hours to contribute because it is public service. And so my instincts was to make sure that my team found you know, good employment, and they did. They all landed in good spots. I wrote them reference letters, helped them with networking. Uh, and then they, my, myself, oh, the other in interesting thing that really stood out, and I remind my colleagues in the House of Commons, because I've seen it all. Um, I've, I've been in government benches. I've been in opposition and back benches. In 2011, no bench. Uh, sitting at home on my bench at home, and uh, and uh, now in 2015, sitting in the front benches, and uh, and one thing is you can't people respect you because of the position you hold, but politicians come and go, and someone else will occupy that position uh, at, at probably uh, sooner than you think. 
So don't get caught up and don't let the position define you. Have those personal attributes, treat people with respect, uh, network, uh, engage people, uh, because uh, you know, there'll be a chance or an opportunity where you'll be in a unique position where you need assistance. And how you treat people when you're in government or as a public figure will really reflect on your opportunities outside of politics. And so for me, I was very, very fortunate that I received some very humbling advice from actually the former Prime Minister uh, prior to Mr. Uh, Martin, Mr. Kretchen, uh, who, who told me a lot about this and said, look, don't underestimate anyone. Don't underestimate the person who uh, opens the door for you. Don't underestimate the person who sits in the front desk. Uh, that, you know, treat people with respect. And because I did that, I was very fortunate post-politics uh, to uh, land a career in academia, taught at Waterloo, taught at Ryerson, uh, but one of the things that stood out for me is as a parliamentarian, you're a public figure and people call you either seeking advice or support or wanting some help uh, or others call you because of your position of influence. So my phone constantly would ring and you felt very, very important. Uh, after the election, that phone stopped to ring. <laughs> so again, it's just a reminder uh, that you know, we're in this unique position. And, uh, and that same thing applies to people, I think, in, in the private sector as well. Uh, and, and obviously, in, in public life, uh, others decide your fate. But, you know, you could have a crisis in your company. Uh, you could have a set of circumstances that puts you in a position where you lose the authority that you have. And how you treat people when you got to that position or when you're in that position will really dictate how you will do uh, after that. And so for me, 2011 was a very humbling experience. But I was very blessed, very fortunate to have good contacts, good relationships, good mentors uh, who guided me through that transition period uh, and, and who kept me grounded. That's, that's great. I think that's a, a really important uh, piece of advice. And I'm, I actually, I, I have to say what we'll do is, is I'll, I'll ask you one more question. We are sh shorter on time than I'd like to be because I, I have way more here that I'd like to hear from you on. And I'm sure everybody else does, but, but we appreciate your time here today. Um, and this is something that you touched on a little earlier around diversity. Now, like on our platform, we don't actually have any information around gender or ethnicity or anything like that. But quite frankly, you just got to take a look down the list of the names and you see that the CPA designation is filled with a lot of diversity. And I, I, I don't really know what it is that, that got us there. And so I wanted to ask you, I mean, this is obviously a great thing to have as a profession. Do you have any insight as to why that might be in our profession? And maybe are there uh, things that we can take from that experience and apply it to some of the professions where we're having problems with, with diversity? So I don't know uh, what the secret sauce is of why the CPs are so diverse. Maybe Carol can speak to this. Um, but look at this room. Uh, this is incredible to see the diversity in this room. And I think uh, it's great to see both men and women, people of different backgrounds, of different perspectives that follow a career in accounting. And that's a huge point of pride. Uh, I think this is our value proposition as a country. I travel the world. Uh, and I can tell you right now, we truly are the envy of the world when it comes to our diversity and multiculturalism. Uh, that's why I promoted uh, this bill, C25, about corporate leadership and diversity. And my vision and my view is if we have corporate leaders of diverse backgrounds running Canadian companies that are very profitable, that are cutting edge, leading innovative companies, then multinational organizations would swallow them up in international governance opportunities. And that really puts Ken on the map because many of these large International companies have global mandates and they're looking where to invest and hopefully Canadians at the most senior level positions could find investment opportunities for Canada. So I've got this kind of calculated long-term strategy of how we can leverage our diversity. And I think uh, same thing with uh, the CPAs. I think in, in, my, in my estimation, we should really encourage these kinds of opportunities uh, at the most senior levels uh, in, in corporate leadership. So we have accountants of diff these different backgrounds, really leveraging that diversity and representing not only the company, uh, but representing Canada, uh, both nationally and internationally as well. And uh, that's really my vision for Canada. I think, you know, we're not going to be able to compete with uh, China and India when it comes to critical mass. They've just got bigger and, and larger numbers than us. Europe is united. Um, and so where does Canada fit in? How, what is our value proposition? How do we differentiate ourselves? How do we distinguish ourselves? How do we compete with other jurisdictions? 
And make no mistake, it's our people, it's our talent, it's our diversity, and uh, there's no better profession than CPAs. And I think the platform you've created is an amazing illustration of connecting CPAs to a community uh, that doesn't fully appreciate that diversity and doesn't necessarily appreciate what accountants can bring together. And I can tell you, I meet many people in the startup community, very few accountants. So I think the work you're doing is, is a, great, uh, uh, a great example of how you're uh, taking CPAs and taking them into an area where uh, it would really benefit uh, us as a, as a country and benefit CPAs because it opened more doors up for them as well. well I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, yeah, you know, I think what you said really rings true when you look at some of the speakers that we've, we've had in the past and the ones that we're having moving forward. I mean, we're really lucky that our designation has so many wonderfully diverse people doing, I mean, diversity in terms of the people and in terms of the paths that they've taken. And it, it really creates a, a, a cool space for us to operate in, no matter how unsexy people think accountants are. We're, <laughs> we're still really, really awesome. So um, I do want to leave uh, as much time as you're willing to provide for questions questions just before we jump into them I do want to give you a small break and ask uh, the the third of our, our partners and our sponsors to come up and say a few words and these are our friends at uh, Connect CPA so Mike uh, would you mind coming up uh, Mike and his uh, yeah, partner I Lior. when I walked in yeah yeah um, Mike and his partner Lior are um, our CPAs they're entrepreneurs and and they're on the cutting edge of uh, of, of accounting, really. They, they, they operate a cloud accounting firm, and they're just a great spokespeople for where our uh, profession is going. So I am going to, here, you know what? There's a mic here. You know, it's good. Let's just, hopefully it's not too loud. Oh, yeah. right. Too loud? No. no really appreciate uh, the introduction, Michael, and, uh, and Minister, uh, amazing hearing your story. Like, truly inspiring to all CPAs, especially in the room. Uh, guys, I'm going to be very, very brief. Uh, really want to talk about three things. One is who is Connect CPA and who we are. Uh, number two, I want to just touch on what FinTech is and what we're supporting. And number three is just to give a little bit of just career guidance to CPAs in the room that might be looking for an alternative path to a traditional route. So Connect CPA is a technology specialist charter accounting firm, and really that's a fancy way of saying we leverage technology to help businesses grow and improve profitability. Uh, we entered the cloud accounting space back in 2014 and with a mission of really disrupting what a traditional accounting firm is. And so right now we service hundreds of corporations Canada-wide and we're after this hiring round will be about 20 people uh, on our team. And the people on our team are progressive accountants that are changing the way small businesses operate and help them grow and prosper in a changing economy. Uh, what Fin and Tech is, it's an amazing alignment between great strategic partners in Luminary and Zero. We're a Zero Platinum partner, and Zero is the platform that we use with our clients to enhance collaboration and the power of the cloud to help our clients improve the profitability and get better visibility over their financial performance. It's amazing to see the alignment of seeing CPA Ontario and top leadership come out and support the changing endeavors that are happening in our space. And it's an exciting time to be a CPA because technology opens up a whole world of opportunity that just didn't exist in the past. So the final thing that I wanted to touch on is career development. Ten, 10 years ago plus when I met my co-founder Lior at PwC, it was, there wasn't startup land. You didn't have that option of working in an environment that was a little bit less corporate where you could have the t-shirt and jeans type environment. It just didn't exist. To fast forward to today as a CPA, you have many, many opportunities. And in our own firm, there's no dress codes, there's no timesheets. All employees on our team have full autonomy of time to control their schedules. And because of that, we're attracting really, really talented people that are looking for a progressive route in, in their careers. And so I do encourage you, check us out at connectcpa.ca. Please do some research on Fin and Tech because we're doing some exciting things and we're actually gonna be teaching the cloud accounting module at Fin and Tech if you wanna come out and learn a little bit more about what we do. Anyway, thanks a lot, Michael, we appreciate it. Great, thank you. Great. Oh. All right. Hello. All right, we're here. Um, so now with 
Uh, thank you, Michael. And um, uh, so with whatever uh, 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 time we have left with the minister, which I think will be maybe like 10 minutes, um, we want to uh, get some questions from the audience for the minister. So uh, hands up and I'll, uh, oh, one popped up quickly. Good evening, Minister Baines. It's uh, very humbling to have you here today. Um, in my current role, I work with early stage science-based startups and it's been really incredible to see the technical breakthroughs that have been coming out of Canada. Um, however, Canada is still, I think, lacking in terms of competitiveness um, relative to other places like Silicon Valley. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on what needs to happen in the next five to 10 years to enable Canada to become a leader in commercialization of research and science um, and how that fits into your mandate as Minister of Innovation. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, oh, thank you. I'm actually going to be heading out to San Francisco in a few days, uh, meeting with uh, many Canadian companies and American companies and talking about our global skills strategy, which is if you're a company in Canada, you want to bring someone high in demand with specialized skills, you can do so in a matter of two weeks. And I think uh, that's very important in a world where people are talking about building walls. Uh, we're talking about opening doors. And we obviously are focused on our number one strength, which is our people, uh, focusing on talent and being a true uh, magnet for global talent and also strengthening domestic talent as well. The question you asked is, it, it's got multiple facets to it and I'll just speak to one particular area because of the, your own background which is we're really good at, at basic research and science in Canada. We represent about 0.5% of the world's population and uh, we have about 2% of the world's publications. Uh, we have well-respected universities that churn out incredible research the challenge is, and we've seen this, is how do we take that research and commercialize it? How do we see the economic benefits of that? And one area where Canada has been lagging versus other countries, particularly the US, and I'll put this in context because there are probably a lot of small businesses here, is an intellectual property. Only 9% of Canadian companies actually have an IP strategy. Only 10% actually own IP. And even if you look at the larger companies in Canada, so if you look at the TSX top 30, if you look at their balance sheet, 40% of their assets are attributed to intellectual property. While in the US S&P 500, 84% of their assets are attributed to IP. So larger companies are well behind and smaller companies are really far behind relative to say the US. And so in the new knowledge economy where we're investing so much in science and research in areas like artificial intelligence, which Canada is also making a big bet on, uh, we think we need to have a strong, robust intellectual property strategy. We just launched it a few weeks ago. And we think this coupled with our overall comprehensive innovation and skills plan, a multi-year plan focus on talent and people development, focus on key emerging technologies and technology adoption, will help companies scale and grow up. The other very quick observation I would say is Canada is well known and well regarded for our startup ecosystem, but we do a very poor job of scaling our companies. And this is one area the government recognizes and we put forward measures uh, to use procurement, to be a marquee customer, to help validate solutions for companies as well. So we've got a range of initiatives, but those are two that I'd highlight that would kind of help us succeed, not in the short term, but long term as well, allow our companies to be more competitive. Uh, and there's more measures coming forward. And, uh, and ultimately, this is about partnership. This is not about government leading the way. This is about us working with industry, working with the business community, working with academia, civil society, using our power to convene uh, and bringing the key actors together, promoting more collaboration. Uh, and fundamentally, what we're trying to do, uh, which is my long term vision, is to change the culture in Canada. We want a culture of innovation. We want Canada to be known as a global innovation leader. And we want to be the place, if you have a good idea, uh, if you want to start up a company, if you want to grow a company, come to Canada. Uh, that's really the vision we have. Uh, and so we're putting forward a multi-year, a multi-pronged effort uh, with the industry to do that. And I thought I'd just highlight the intellectual property, just to illustrate uh, the commercialization challenge uh, that I think you know you could probably relate to from your own experiences. Great. I think we just have time for one more. Unfortunately, uh, oh, you know what? I, I saw somebody put up their. Are they? Quick I'll be more brief. No, no. I'll be more brief. 
And let's get a few more in. I'll, okay, I'll keep yeah. my answer short. Great, great. Yeah, sure. So I saw that hand, then that hand, then that hand. So I'll go in that order. Um, Mr. Minister, thank you so much uh, for coming. It's a pleasure to meet you here, and uh, it's uh, humble to have you here. I know that uh, for a fact that we have Elite Hub for technology and uh, and uh, for technology down in Waterloo, and we have digital as well, like filmmaking and all of uh, all of uh, all kind of this uh, stuff down in GTA area as well. And uh, we have a lot of elite companies, uh, American companies uh, like Google and, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, um, travel agencies as well, the travel agencies, online travel agencies who does businesses here in Canada in the name of American businesses. And uh, all of their uh, business is executed from Canada and made by Canadian people and developed by Canadian people. Why we don't simply promote, uh, promote Canada as... Uh, as, uh, as the innovator of this business. Why we don't simply uh, promote ourselves as uh, a manufacturer and a creator of, of these platforms and these movies and, uh, and, uh, and these technology companies? Why, why we don't do that? <laughs> thank no, you so much. No, thank you for your question. Uh, we um, recognize that we have a lot of strengths here in Canada, I obviously highlighted the talent and, and the people proposition and the diversity that we have. But we are also very you know, blessed with natural resources and key sectors as well. The challenge is it's tough for government to prescribe where the growth areas will be, where the market opportunities are, where the consumer trends are, where investors want to go. So what we did is we created this new initiative called Super Clusters. And the idea is to really focus on Canadian companies that can scale and grow and attract investments into Canada. And what this initiative is, it's a competitive process where we put close to a billion dollars and it was matched dollar for dollar, if not more, by the private sector, where we brought academia, Canadian companies, international companies as well, small businesses in particular, but obviously large anchor firms as well, uh, non-for-profit to come together to determine where the areas of high growth. And we ultimately selected five and there were over 50 that applied. One is a digital platform, a digital initiative, digital super cluster from British Columbia. One is in agriculture and protein coming from out the prairies. One is in around advanced manufacturing, uh, around additive manufacturing that has really emerged from Ontario. One is around artificial intelligence and scale AI uh, from Quebec. And the last one being from ocean super cluster from Atlantic Canada. And the exciting part is these are platforms. So they first of all impact many different sectors. Secondly, many, many Canadian companies are involved and of the vast majority of the companies are small businesses. And so the hope from our point of view is this is an industry-led initiative. This is really designed to identify areas of strength, areas of growth. And what we've done is really focused on making sure we unlock more money for research and development. And we want to see those benefits in Canada. So this is part of our new smart industrial policy. It's really about how do we see more investments in innovation through R&D and how do we see that in Canada with the Canadian ecosystem and implicating Canadian companies and international companies to really, first of all, strengthen our ecosystem here before we go international. And the idea is we want our companies not only to succeed in Canada, but globally as well, to be part of global supply chain. So I hope that kind of answers your question in terms of what our strategy is of helping companies in Canada and how, how we view, you know, how we view industrial policy in the 21st century. Good evening, Mr. Baines. Um, thanks for coming. And, and, and the answer to this question might have been hidden in your last uh, couple answers, but you mentioned that you have a very clear definition of uh, innovation. And I know you don't like that word or, uh, you're tired of it. No, I love the word. I just think time is used out of context. Sure. So I just want to get clarification on what your definition, that clear definition of innovation is and how does that serve you? So when, when I think of innovation and when I talk to people, people assume innovation is about the latest gadget, the latest iPhone, the latest technology. Fundamentally for me, innovation is about solving problems, about challenging the status quo, about doing things better. 
And so uh, innovation is how do, we, how do we move forward? And for example, there's a lot of innovation happening in agriculture. No one assumes that, but there's a lot of technology, a lot of new processes, a lot of new way of thinking and doing things differently in agriculture that allows our Canadian agriculture sector to succeed not only in Canada, but globally as well. But people don't associate innovation with agriculture or forestry or mining. And so that's the challenge. When people think of innovation, the first thought that comes to their mind is the, the latest invention, and the latest technology. But innovation is much, much broader than that. Um, and the challenge I have when people use innovation is they don't necessarily have innovation that's going to challenge the status quo or solve a problem or make a difference. They do the same old things and they just, they just put the stamp called innovation on it. So I've seen many companies that claim to be very innovative but that continue to do the same things. So that's where I kind of uh, get a bit frustrated because they are misrepresenting what innovation is from my point of view, which is endeavoring to do better, to solve, uh, to challenge the status quo, to do things differently, to have a different viewpoint and it's much, much broader. So when I said I had a clear definition, it's, it's the fact that it applies to a much broader um, area than simply technology companies. Uh, and, uh, and I would say in Canada, uh, innovation is taking place in a lot of these key sectors where people wouldn't necessarily think of instinctively, like agriculture, like forestry, like mining. And, and I think that's what we need to be cognizant of, is that we can't fall for the trap of innovation simply being Google and Facebook. It's much, much broader than that. Okay, so we, we did promise uh, this lady up the front that Absolutely. she'd get her question. Let's try to, let's try so, to go. So that young fellow right there is on my team. He keeps on giving dirty looks, but if you ignore him, we can continue the conversation. <laughs> That's okay, my co-founder is doing the same thing to me. So. <laughs> Sorry about it. No, you don't need to apologize. <laughs> Uh, I work on the PR firm and also I'm CPA as well. And uh, the question is uh, Ontario and uh, election as well be just started this week, right? So liberal keeps saying, you know, and we will run for the, you know, the senior and the house care and the children for the future. So we will go to the, you know, and the deficit, right? And however, for the, you know, in the dark forward and the conservative, we will cutting the you know, middle class tax, and we will, you know, reduce the you know, burden. So what do you interpret for the, you know, the, the debt, right? How you, you know, think, you know, the liberal the message in the, to the, those, you know, in the taxpayers? Would you, you know, in the, because I work in the PR every day, it's news. And <laughs> there. So just for you as a professional accountant, right, and also as a, politicians, so how you interpret, you know, Kastner Wins said over, you know, we ran for the deaths for the six years. So it's a great question because it's a timely question. There's a provincial campaign going on right now. There's a healthy debate about the, the future of Ontario. You have three leaders that are articulating their vision uh, for Ontario. And I think, um, you know, just to take a step back, first of all, I'll uh, answer the specific technical question around deficits and debts and then just on the provincial campaign. As a politician, one thing that I'm very sensitive to is how do we, uh, in a very thoughtful way, in a respectful way, in a responsible way, take the a public uh, purse, so taxpayers' money, and deploy it in a way that gets maximum benefit. So respect for taxpayers, uh, using resources in a responsible and thoughtful way is very important. Um, I think of the public money as if it was my own money. And if I had to make decisions, what are those trade-offs? At home, I make those same trade-offs. What are the same things we do when it comes to public policy? So that's my overarching mindset. When it comes to, at the federal level, when it comes to our fiscal situation, uh, we have a debt to GDP ratio, which is the best amongst the G7 countries. So yes, you know, we have a debt. Yes, we have deficit. But our situation relative to our G7 peers, we're in a very strong position. Secondly, we as a government have made a calculation, as we run modest deficits, we're going to see greater growth rates in the economy, which will reduce our debt to GDP ratio. So right now we're hovering slightly above 30%. Over the next five years, that'll be below 30%. And the key for us is, when we ran in the campaign in 2015, we said we needed a growth agenda. So if you look at revenue and expenses, we want to make sure we get more revenue. 
That's the game. How do we grow the economy more? So we put forward a plan. Uh, we articulate that plan in our two to three budgets that we put forward in our platform. And we've seen the economy grow more than 3%. We've seen jobs being created across the country, over 600,000 jobs, vast majority full time. So we feel we're on the right track. That is a vision. Some may share that, some may not. And I, and I respect that. I'm not saying uh, what I say uh, everyone should agree with, but we articulated this very clearly in the campaign. We're following three, through on it, and we're seeing the economic benefits of it. So that's how we, you know, explain our fiscal framework, explain how we expend or spend taxpayers' money, where we're spending their money on, and what kind of returns are we getting for, for our fellow citizens. On the provincial side of it, this is the debate that's happening in Ontario as well. The fiscal situation in Ontario is a bit different than it is federally. Uh, the, the fiscal burden in Ontario is much higher than it is in other provinces, but the growth rate in Ontario, the economy is doing better than some of the other jurisdictions, jobs are better. And so I think you as, as, a, as a citizen, as a taxpayer, as someone who's politically engaged, as a CPA, you should you know, look at the platforms, look at where the priorities are of the parties, what are they investing in? Who's investing in healthcare and education? Are they a priority for you? Or do you want to see more money in infrastructure? Or is balanced books, for example, a priority for you? I would strongly encourage look at those issues and then make an informed decision because it's very easy in today's day and age to get caught up in the 30 second ad or a personality debate or get caught up in some sort of smear campaign and make a decision. I think. Uh, one of the things that accountants are known for uh, is we're rational thinkers. We look at, you know, we look at the pros and cons. We look at the choices. We are strategic and we're thoughtful. And I, I strongly encourage go online and check out the platforms. See where they want to deploy the resources. And are those consistent with your values? Are they consistent with your priorities? And that's how I recommend you make your choice. Uh, because political parties, you know, uh, have ideology, but because of circumstances, that ideology changes as well, right? Uh, and I say this respectfully, but Stephen Harper and the conservative governments talked a lot about balanced books, but they ran a deficit of $150 billion. And part of the reason was they were dealing with a depression, a recession, right, in 2008, 2009. So ideology sounds good, but sometimes circumstances are out of your control and you have to have the nimbleness and ability to adapt to be able to deal with these crises or situations that occur. So uh, bottom line is, in on the Ontario campaign, there's going to be a lot of money spent on advertisements, a lot online, a lot of news coverage. Uh, but to avoid all that noise, just go and check out their platforms, do the analysis, take out your calculator, I suspect you have one, uh, and uh, you know, make an informed decision. And I think that's the part that's so important. And what's for me is very frustrating. Many, many, many Ontarians, many Canadians don't vote. And if you don't vote, then you don't have a say. People come up to me and say, oh, I disagree with you on this, or you know, I'm very frustrated with this, and my question to them is, did you vote? They say no. I said, then you don't have a say. Because you had an opportunity. You had an opportunity to impact the outcome. You chose not to. Then, you know, yes, you can complain and you can argue, but why are you wasting an opportunity to have an impact? So my humble suggestion to you would be, please go out and vote, and make sure you make an informed decision. Thank you, everyone, for your questions, and thank you so much, Minister Baines. This has been amazing. Another round of applause. Let's do it. Um, you know, yeah, right, stand up. Hey. <laughs> um, you, you know, I think the minister is, is a huge inspiration to us as CPAs, and um, I just we, we were so grateful to have your time today. So we do want to offer you a small token of our appreciation. Uh, chocolate. No, um, <laughs> damn, why didn't we get chocolate? Uh. No. But, but what there is, is, is one of these. Ah. And, I mean, it's not a startup if you don't have a shirt, right? This, this is some luminary propaganda? <laughs> yes, we definitely would like some of that all over CBC. So thank you so much for coming out. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, just, oh, I don't know why I'm holding on to this, but uh, that is yours. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention before we wrap up today is we always end on a, just a little update on Luminary and our update today is simple. We are at 10,000 CPAs strong now. So uh, yeah, 
very exciting time. We've got a lot of awesome things planned for CPA, so thank you for your support. Thank you for coming out tonight. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you at the next event.